I think as it yeah. pertains to the goalposts, look, um, I think that the letters are actually something that the industry just needs to do away with. And we at Scale really don't try to talk about those letters because um, there was investors and I've been in the industry long enough in 2005 and 2000 that were like, oh, we only do series A's or we only do series B's or whatever it may be. And... Disclaimer number one, guests and hosts drink on this show. And we ask that if you join us, you be of legal age and you drink responsibly. Number two, if you want to know about check size, stage, similar questions, this is the wrong podcast for you. On Drink to the VC, we're all about digging a little bit deeper and getting to know the person behind the investment decisions. Hello, and welcome to Drinks with a VC. Thanks for tuning in on whatever platform you are using. My name is Vic Laquara. I am the co-founder and managing director of Seed Fund Green Cow Venture Capital. And I'm joined, as always, by my co-hostess with the mostest, Bree. Bree, hi. She leads BizDev at Berkeley, which is a wonderful firm that provides CFO services for technology startups. Bree, it's been a while. Uh, you've been in one of my favorite places, Kauai. How was that? It was great. It has been a while. I was in the lovely Kauai, and now, as you can see, I've changed locations again to Colorado. Um, We've had some exciting news, especially you, since our last episode. Um, yeah. Congrats. You've had an exit with Bear Flag Robotics. You want to fill me in real quick? Man, I, you know, I, I don't like to plug myself and my portfolio companies on this podcast, but we are extremely excited uh, for Gino, Aubrey, and the whole team. They're going to join John Deere with that $250 million exit and acquisition. Awesome. Uh, really just couldn't be more excited for that team. And um, it was so fun to spend uh, a few hours with the founders and with the whole team. Last week, uh, met some representatives from John Deere and it was just a fantastic time. So extremely lucky and things are, things are crazy over here. Um, but I am really excited. Uh, <laughs> I know I say that every single time, but honestly, uh, this episode, we get to chat with one of my oldest and dearest friends in, in the venture capital world, but also just generally. Uh, he's just one of the most genuine human beings on the planet. Uh, I actually met him uh, when he had just moved up from LA and he had been investment banking and he had just joined Crossland Capital in 2009 or 2010. And, uh, you know, at Crosslink, he was part of their investments in Bleacher Report, uh, Marin Software, Take Lessons, Flurry, and Prosper. And then in 2013, he moved over to Scale, and he was the principal at Scale, where he sourced investments like Drone Deploy and Forder. And then four years later, he's made partner, surprise, surprise, uh, at the same firm at Scale, uh, where his core focus is in vertical software. Uh, and um, he sits on, look, Keep Trucking, Proxy, Spruce, Procia, uh, Archipelago, um, just like a whole host of companies, fantastic companies are doing so well. Uh, but please, with that, welcome to the show, the pride of Southern California's Corona Del Mar, Alex Nyhanke. Hi, Alex. Right. Go see Kings. Impressive. <laughs> for for those that don't know, that is my high school mascot. Wow. The sea and it was also a middle, uh, there was a middle school. And when you were in middle school, you were the seaweed. So I, I always thought that was pretty cute. Oh, so wait, where in Corona Del Mar did you live? Which one of the streets? Um, so I didn't live in Corona Del Mar. Um, I moved to Southern California. I'm actually not a Southern California native. I moved there in sixth grade. And we moved around. Um, first, we lived in Spyglass Hill. This is now um, really uninteresting for you know your listeners that don't know the area, but um, um, is uh, is an area that used to be super undeveloped and then got very very developed while I was there. So I think when we moved to Newport Beach, it was maybe 30, 35,000 people, and and I think there's over a hundred thousand people in Newport Beach now. So a lot of development by a large organization called the Irvine Company down there while while I was living there. Yeah. Very cool. yeah, there's been a huge boom in, in the Southern California, Irvine Cove, that whole that whole area. Mm -hmm. uh, today, we're drinking Negronis. Yes. 
what the hell is the reasoning behind the Negroni? I'm excited because for once I'm not drinking bourbon or whiskey or scotch on this show. We're actually drinking gin based drink. I mean, I, I think the, the really simple answer is because they're delicious. Uh, but I, I can, you know, look, I can give you a few, few riffs on Negronis, but the, the very simple riff is that I started drinking them at some point in time, 10, 20 years ago. And you're like, Ooh, these are good. They're utilitarian in the sense that you can, you know, uh, not that I ever drank before noon, but you could have one before noon, never do that. Um, you can never do that them in the afternoon in the sun. They work during cold winter. They work as an aperitif and they also work, uh, as a end of meal drink. I, I kind of think if I think about like the world of, of food and drink culture, I feel like the Japanese and our, like the French are like brilliant when it comes to like technique, right? Mm -hmm. But when it comes to practicality, the Italians win in my book and the Negroni, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like the classic, you know, it's got that little bitterness that, that the Italians like, obviously the Campari in there. And mm -hmm. I don't know, the Italians get those things right. And then unlike most cocktails, it's a one to one to one. Uh, uh, mixture. So there's really very little to remember as well. So they're super easy to make. Although there's a lot of interesting riffs on Negronis these days as well, if anybody wants to get into them at some point. We, of course, care about these things. Uh, <laughs> no, we do. And actually, cheers to you. I'm so happy that you chose Negronis. Uh, cheers. Original and really refreshing, particularly as it's a little bit warmer here in the Bay Area right now. Uh, we have a little bit of insulation with the, the fire and the smoke uh, wafting over into San Francisco. So um, it's nice to have a, a cool drink over here. So I hear you also like wine. I'd love to hear uh, more about your wine interest as well. What got you into wine tasting? Um, well, wine, I like wine and I like food and I also like booze. And I think a lot of the times when people talk about their love for wine, they're they like miss like one crucial aspect of it, which is that it has alcohol in it, right? And so that's like a nice <laughs> convenient part of wine that nobody ever wants to talk about. And I do enjoy that aspect of it. Uh, but um, I think that um, shortly after college, I had an experience where I was actually on a bachelor party of all things. And somebody brought a really nice bottle of, of wine, a big Magnum, mm -hmm. and we made steaks. And I'd had wine before and my parents always drank wine around the dinner table, but I never thought much about it because in college I was mostly convinced that alcohol came in a plastic bottle or a tin can <laughs> uh, and um and and I remember drinking this this red wine and it was uh it was an eye-opening experience around what alcohol could be when it was it was well made and it just worked so well even at a bachelor party where god knows what we were doing that uh, I, I remember thinking I want more of this um and I called my dad who always seemed to have a good penchant for picking out wines and he laughed when I told him I wanted to learn more about wine and which books I should read and um, and what I should do. And I asked him a few more times and he kept laughing at me. And uh, I told him that I was being serious. And finally, my dad asked me whether I truly wanted to learn more about wine. And I, I said, yes. And so he said, well, then I recommend drinking more. Um, and I think that was, you know, that was probably the most honest and brutal feedback that I've gotten when it comes to wine, which is I think the best way to discover wine is to drink it. Yeah. You know, before we had children, it allowed my wife and I to have just a lot of wonderful vacations because it turns out that you can travel to a lot of places in the world. And sometimes you get forced to have the same experiences that everybody else does. But when you love wine, you can sometimes go visit places because you want to go eat at a certain restaurant or drink the wines of a certain producer or visit a certain producer. And so you you get to see the paths less traveled and you get to encounter the local cultures more. And, and then, you know, for us at home, and now that we have children and we don't go out as much anymore, cooking is a big part of our household as well. And I was reading a book around, around wine, um, um, actually over the last few months, and the, the author concluded about why wine could be so special. And this resonated with me, which was um, you could make it part of your ritual at home. And that ritual is almost like a surprise or a celebration at the end of many days where mm. you do all the things that are important to you. And then at the end of the day, you cook a nice meal and you have a nice bottle of wine with that. And both of those things feel like a celebration. And I think in our household, it really is, is something that my wife and I just really enjoy together. And, yeah. and it does feel like after, you know, we both work really hard at our respective businesses. It feels like something that we then get to do together. And it's, it's, it's always slightly different because we're always trying a different bottle of wine. As long as I've known you, you really always embraced and loved your German upbringing, right? You mentioned that you weren't born and raised in CDM. You went there for high school, but you were actually born in Hamburg. Yep. Uh, does your love of wine translate to a 
love of Rieslings? Is Rieslings like your favorite style of wine? Um, no, I, I don't have, so I do love Riesling. Um, yeah. I, I think it's one of the most wonderful white wines and I, I, I drink a tremendous amount of Riesling, um, German Riesling, but also there's great Rieslings being made in other places. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that Rieslings are particularly special because they're so dynamic as a grape and as a wine. And so I think a lot of people that end up drinking a lot of wine like Riesling because of all the different expressions that it has. But I don't think, I mean, maybe my German pride makes me proud that that also comes from my country. Interestingly, yeah. Riesling and wine culture, Germany is still a beer country. And so yeah. you can actually buy a lot of great German Rieslings in the US because the Germans don't drink it. My mom's Austrian, I'm half Austrian. Austria produces gorgeous wines. Austria is a wine drinking country. And so trying to get Austrian wines in the US is very difficult because the Austrians all drink their own wines. Um, but I also love California wines and I love French wines and I particularly love Italian wines. So um, I don't know if my, my German influence had me, it definitely made me more comfortable with if anybody who's ever tried to buy a bottle of Riesling, man, oh man, the Germans, as they try to make everything super complicated and are incapable yes. of good marketing, the labels on Riesling are, you know, you need a PhD to figure out what the heck is going on on <laughs> that bottle of wine. So, you know, I like the cars that we build, but like we're good at hardware, we're terrible at software, which says everything you need to know about Germans and maybe me as well. Uh, lots of people, lots of your friends know you as uh, a wine lover. Um, one thing that they might not know about you, and we're going to jump straight into a funny little tidbit about you. Uh, that we came across uh, is that you have an unusual hobby and that's pickling. Um, I don't know if you started with gherkins or not, but how the hell did you get into pickling? Um, I don't know. I think that on, on the margin, I probably have some bizarre form of OCD because I don't like throwing things out. Yep. And um, we, we joined a uh, Look, I went to Cal, so there's probably a strain of hippie in me, and I live in San Francisco, and I think San Francisco, uh, contrary to everything that Twitter's saying right now, is a wonderful and beautiful place to live, which probably means that I'm somewhere on the spectrum of, you know, hippiness. But um, we joined, uh, probably a decade ago, we joined a CSA, a Community Supported Agriculture box, where we get our vegetables on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm from a farm outside of Davis. And it wasn't motivated by some sort of hippie motivation. It was actually motivated by the very simple fact that I was buying strawberries at Safeway year round, mind you, which was wonderful. And they didn't taste like freaking strawberries. They tasted like crap actually. And uh, both of my grandparents and my parents always had vegetable gardens growing up, um, maybe more common in, in Germany and Austria or a generational thing, I, I don't know. And um, it, it, I, I grew up with my parents cooking seasonally. That is, they just didn't cook certain vegetables or fruit during certain parts of the year. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think I was exposed to that. And I didn't think about that for, you know, from like the period of like, like 18 to 28, I didn't think about that. And then I woke up one day and I was like, what is the shit that I'm putting in my mouth? Like, it's all just terrible. And I started thinking about seasonality again. And the CSA box was a beautiful way to solve that. But the side effect when you start thinking about seasonal purchasing of anything is how do you deal with excess produce or all the leftovers that you have in a veggie box? And the natural natural next thing that you then research is preservation. And yep. pickling is a beautiful form of preservation. And so I started really enjoying that. Um, the only problem is that my wife now thinks that she's married to her grandmother, but that is <laughs> what it is. And, you know, do you she wear a cap? Um, I, I do have an apron. Gloves, apron I, I, I have a drawer full of my pickling and jamming equipment, Brie, if you want to come over and check <laughs> it out. Nobody's allowed in it other than me. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> you know what? We might actually take you up on that um, yeah. invite, especially as we get into uh, the beginning of our segment, VC Unboxing. Um, right. And so let's just kick this thing off. First of all, cheers again. Alex, thanks for being on the show. What Please. do you guys think of the Negronis now that we're not doing? I mean, are you guys okay oh, with man. this? Are you like, well, I'll put up with it because this guy's making me do it and I have mm -mm, to. Mm -mm. No, I'm loving it. Again, from my standpoint, I just love the the difference because we've just always had whiskey-based drinks uh, on here. And it feels like, come on, guys, let's let's do something a little bit different. And so I like how Three? you shook things up a little bit. Really? I was unable to pull off the Negronis in our area. I'm, mm -hmm. and I don't have access to a grocery store right now, so um, I'm in the middle of nowhere. But I did have a bottle of whiskey, which is what we always mm -hmm. drink, unfortunately. And I would prefer a Negroni, but this is yeah. good whiskey. It's a it's a Colorado local whiskey called Laws. Oh, Vaz. Okay. Laws. Have you ever, have you had High West? 
why I love High West. That's in Utah, though. Yeah, they're Utah. I'm trying to think of other yeah, Colorado-based. Free, the you no know, uh, supermarket in the area, the middle of nowhere. You're talking my cup of tea. Um, I like what you're doing. I don't know what you're doing, but I like what you're doing. Exactly. I'm still on for, this podcast, though. For, for a very <laughs> social person whose job it is to interact with other human beings, I, I, I kind of like getting off the grid. You got to do it every once in a while. I, I might like it more than my personality reveals. How about that? Oh. Yeah. Well, so Brie is the natural personality uh, analyzer of of the two of us. I and so I always ask her these questions like, "Am I an EMT or no?" That's not even a thing. What is? Yeah. What am I? The EMT is somebody that comes to your house when you're having health problems. Mm -hmm. That's right. See, there you go. Yeah. I'm not one of those. That's an intro. Wait, what is it? Uh, I can't even say it. It's a. It's like an eye, nose, throat doctor. And that's EMT. right. That's right. That's right. The ENT. Intero, I can't even say it. I can't pronounce it. Good. Good luck. I don't know what it is, but I feel like I'm very, I'm very much more introverted than people think I am. Like I'm extroverted in those situations, but then I like coming home and kind of coming back into the shell and just hanging out in my space. And if it's away from everybody else, then all the better. Yeah. Are you introverted or extroverted, Alex? That's a good question. I wonder about that sometimes as well. Um, I mean, so much of my job, I think what nobody ever tells you about the venture gig mm -hmm. is that it's such a heavy sales and marketing job. And I'm, I'm quite keen and aware of that. So I must have a really strong extroverted part of me. And I think that Vic touched on it. So I was, I was born in Germany and I moved to the US in second grade. You know, I, I went to, and I went to multiple schools in New York. I switched schools a few times in, while well, I was living in Southern California, I went to back to Austria for a year. I, I had a lot of my childhood, I was being put into new environments and I had to make Ooh. friends very quickly or not make friends and be very lonely. And so I'm very comfortable um, while having the same discomfort that everybody else does walking into a networking room or an event or the things that we used to do post COVID. Cause I think I experienced that a lot in my childhood. Yeah. And so I think that people perceive me to be extroverted and I, I check all of those boxes, but um, I always tell Shannon, my wife that, you know, I, I think that I probably have my forever job and I probably have my forever firm and I'm quite satisfied with what I'm doing. But if I'm retiring, it's to like a ranch in the Sierra foothills mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. off the grid that has a, you know, if you come on this property, I'll shoot you sign. And I might not see other human beings other than, you know, once a week when I go to the grocery store and that sounds deeply satisfying to me. I don't know. She kind of laughs, which means it probably isn't true because she knows me better than I know myself. And it may just be that like counter reaction to what I deal with all day long, which is humans. Yeah. Um, but there is an introverted part of me as well. My aunt once told me that when I was a child, she was always amazed at um, how I would for hours entertain myself um, more so than other children. And she works with young children. So maybe there's an introverted part of me. Hmm. Well, I, I do want to get into the unboxing, but you got to get have, have into you, the unboxing. Given the number of boxes you guys, sent, I, I know be unboxing for an hour and a half here, Vic. We're going to be unboxing for a long Went time. Went a little over. Vic was like Santa. He had his elves running around on this one. Have, yeah. have, Bree, have you seen <laughs> Vic around the holidays? The dude goes goes to the nines. I, I do go a little nuts. I, do like I mean, like like some people like kind of get into it. Vic is like he's got like multiple outfits. He's He's doing like every Santa crawl. He's got parties at his house. I like the guy gets the spirit. I like it. I do. I do. I think that's because my family, you know, coming from an Indian family. Uh, and Did like, you guys celebrate uh, uh, Christmas growing up or not really? I think we forced our parents to, right? Like we forced them to get a tree. We I love America. Them I to love like America. Try and believe in Santa, in Santa Claus. We tried, you know, <laughs> and, um, but at the end of the day, it was just about presents. It was about the tree. It was about, you know, it was like, it was like Thanksgiving at our house. Like we celebrated Thanksgiving. Um, we didn't do it with a turkey ever. My dad hated turkey, right? But like, we would do like tandoori chicken, you know, mm. during Thanksgiving. So, uh, so I, I challenge you on that because people are always like, do you celebrate as an immigrant? Do you celebrate? I actually think Thanksgiving is our holiday. It's not, mm. I don't know, Bri, maybe you're here for a few generations. I'm now making a judgy statement, but, um, um, <laughs> but like, um, but like um, um, Thanksgiving is an immigrant's holiday, right? It, it's a celebration of people coming to this country and sharing their harvest with other people from this country and the message. Sure. And so I actually think Thanksgiving 
but the the Christmas thing I think is is also just super neat and incredible. I mean, I'm super unreligious. Yeah. My dad was a Catholic. My mom was a Lutheran. So I guess, yeah, I guess like yeah, I was raised in it, but like for us, it's about the trees and the presents as well. Yeah, I, mom Hindu, dad atheist, and uh, you know, I, I think I'm a mishmash of a lot of different religions that you know I find interest in and. Yeah, I just think it was all about the spirit, like the happiness. It was about the jolliness. It was like, you know, even before I could drink, right? It was about, you know, decorating and lights and, you know, just the extreme joy part of it. And I think, I don't know. I feel like that's something that I've really missed in the pandemic. We normally have our, our holiday party um, and I'm dying for that to come back. I, I hope we get to some normalcy. But anyway, we, uh, what's what's the turkey situation at the Hansons around Thanksgiving? Yeah, what did the Hansons we do? Are, well, my my family definitely has a turkey contest. It's always between my mom and my dad, and they like try it. to win everybody's uh, affections with their turkey making. My dad always tried to do something wild and different, like the mm. smoked turkey or the fried turkey. He kind of goes, or like he'll do some sort of weird process, and my mom goes traditional, and then every year it's a vote. How many how many listens or downloads does this podcast need to get for me to get an invite to this competition? Oh, well, you're going to have to go to Florida. So as long as you're in for Florida, my mom would love if you came with Shannon and your two boys. She would like, we have, they have a pool. She would get it all set up. They have all sorts of toys. My brother has a boat. My dad has a swamp buggy. I don't know if you know what those are, but you like ride through the swamps on a tractor. That's like, covered in basically metal it's pretty cool Gosh, so, and, and COVID doesn't exist in Florida this sounds fantastic it sure doesn't Seriously, not in our uh, household I'm just gonna ring up my mother-in-law right now and just let her know we're not coming to St. <laughs> Louis for Thanksgiving we're going to Florida and oh, Alex is coming it. with us he's gonna make a turducken he's gonna put that into the race against or the competition against the other two turkeys this my mom would like cry if this many people came over for thanksgiving she would be so happy <laughs> all right well we're gonna try and make this happen then absolutely uh okay okay getting way off topic um something that you do in solitude uh is pickling clearly um you like you like that space to yourself and in order to honor that space uh please open up space bag so the bag that has oh, space bag. Stuff. All right. Um, for, and, for listeners and viewers, I'm stepping off of camera very quietly too. Yes. Oh, and well, also space get bag the, is heavy. Space yes, space bag, is, bag really is heavy. heavy. Uh, um, and it's go ahead. gonna be tough to open it, I think. We'll see. Um, well, I, I have these Westcott titanium scissors right here. Um, oh, okay. And um, um I think one of your other uh, guests, maybe it was uh, Sarah, um, was saying, you know, the struggle when you have children at home of trying to prevent them from opening these, you guys, this oh, was man. like, this is like the Olympics, right? Like there's people winning gold in, in Japan. I yeah. was winning gold at home from at keeping home. these from all my kids. So They're the um, brightest colored bags ever, right? right. I don't well, know there's if any- book, There's a book in here, if I can get it out. Yep, yep, okay. Is that book? That book isn't something that my kids shoved in there. That's part of the. Uh, no, no, that's something that. Yeah, that's part of it. Um, it was tough to find a bag that was big enough, by the way, for. Koji for all this. Alchemy, boom! Yes, I love it. Um, I, I, I think that this is going to be. Um, well, we'll be polite. I don't know if I'm not. It'll, this will be effing awesome because this is like going to get technical, isn't it? This feels technical. I like it. it Asian pickle. But it's going to get technical um, and you're going to love it. I did. I've done kimchi a couple times. My kimchi game needs to step up. You know, like Korean restaurants where you show up and they just give you like mm -hmm. the 10 trays of pickled food. It's best. It's the best. I, I, I need up my, my Asian pickling game. Hold yes. on. I got a big yes. box here that has a. Oh, is this what yeah. I think it is? Uh, I saw the picture on the side of the thing. Is this like some sort of like. Um, pickling jar situation is this what's going on here well, yeah 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 to those listeners uh you know the Berklin folks by the way Berklin uh, amazing firm that provides CFO services the Berklin folks Bree, Josh, Ren, everyone behind the scenes uh they are givers and um they're just so generous with their time with their um with their capital etc and I think, you know, 
they just love coming up with amazing gifts for our guests. So, you know, they don't get it enough, but cheers to everyone. I'm snapping my fingers right now. That's the way that I clap, I guess, on, on Zoom calls now. Um, Sorry, everybody, for all the noise. This was no, it's okay. really hard to open up. Kind of exciting. Um, I'm not going to go further because it's going to get ugly. No, no, yeah, it's don't. A, it's a... It's a um, it's a, how do I describe this? This is where like English second language is an issue. Um, it's a, um, it's a um, clay, big clay jar that you can pickle stuff in, I yes. imagine. I'm gonna have to read about this. this is really yeah, cool. you should, you're gonna have to read about it, but the books will also help you in your journey. Um, you should also get the Happy Face Refrigerator back. I'm very Happy excited face. about this, just based on what you were talking a little about earlier on in this episode. Where did my scissor go? Here it is. Uh, and we don't normally do this, uh, and obviously the podcast is sponsored by by Berkeley, but uh, as a special present from my friends at Ugly Pickle, they got you a few jars of their favorites. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't know that I have had Ugly Pickle Co., and I am so excited. So we have burger party dills. We have bread and butter. Yeah, the bread and butters are amazing. Those are fantastic um, on everything barbecue. And we have dilly carrots. I yeah. am going to chow down on those. Uh, One so, of the things that makes me happy is that my three and a half year old likes pickles almost as much as I do. So lovely. That's so that's a win. And what you should know about these pickles is that they take up, they, they up, what, what is it called? Upcycled veggies. Uh, so they take all of the imperfect veggies and uh, make something amazing out of them uh, for everyone to eat. You can find them on Whole Foods. You can get them on Imperfect Foods, all that good stuff. So anyway, shout out to the Ugly Pickles folks. Thanks for, thanks for hooking Alex up. Um, so I I'm going to move on. Uh, we've been talking a lot about your parents, um, the kids. Uh, I'm obsessed and any of our listeners know this, I'm just really obsessed with the roles that our parents and other adults around us uh, played or didn't play in our career paths. Uh, and I also feel like in parallel to that, to be a really good VC, you need to really embrace the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and your dad, like my dad, uh, was a serial entrepreneur. Um, is that where you got your love of entrepreneurship and if not where where did you get it i think that i probably should give most if not all the credit to my dad for my passion for entrepreneurship it also maybe is why i don't have the courage to be an entrepreneur myself mm. my dad built a string of bootstrap businesses uh, some successful some very successful um, and then some less so successful um, but unlike, you know, I think the way that the fairy tale gets written, the later parts of his career were quite tough, whereas the early parts of his career were quite good. And that was an interesting family experience, which probably can't all get packed into this podcast. But, um, but my dad was always bootstrapped. And one of the things that was noteworthy was watching somebody move to a country. You know, he didn't have a college degree. He didn't have any of those fancy things. And trying to build a, a support network and advice and high quality lawyers and accountants and all the things that you require. And I think that some of the challenges that he countered in his businesses was by not having the best network of advisors around him. And so I, I think that was another interesting experience and, and lesson that I gained. I, I think I, I understand the volatility and the challenge of the entrepreneurial journey. And then, you know, as it pertains to my dad, he's, he's a classic Northern German post-war man who, um, you know, emotions don't really exist in his, in his sphere. Um, mm. As much as, you know, the American culture has that, that was not something that existed in, in my childhood. But uh, politics and business do exist in his world. And so if you want to interact with my dad, you know, you, you got to find one of those two things to talk about. And since he was usually working eight days a week, because that's what his companies required, because they were generally people driven businesses, and he was the person I spent a lot of my childhood and the weekends with my dad at his company. And we would talk about the company and the business and all those things. And, you know, he lives back, he moved back to Germany a couple of years ago. Uh, he was out here for three weeks ago now. And, you know, of all the things that we did together while he was out here, I sometimes wonder whether the thing that he loves more than anything is hearing about the businesses that I'm contemplating investing in, or I'm an investor in the challenges of those. And then rapping with me about the business models and the permutations and all of those things. I think that the amount of pleasure that it gives him is obviously as a child, 
you always want to find those connection points with your parents. And so I think that inspires me. And hopefully my, 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 my entrepreneurs that I partner with feel that I'm emphatic about, you know, the things that on their personal lives, the entrepreneurial journey has, uh, I'd like to think that I'm more emphatic in that area. Having given, having had that experience. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, you'd have to ask them ultimately, but I try. So um, I know you mentioned at one point you had worked for your dad, maybe not your most favorite work experience. Uh, why was that? Um, well, because my dad was a CEO. <laughs> <laughs> what was he like to work for? Uh, look, my dad, my dad is a very old school manager, right? I studied business in college and they talk about all of the different management techniques and none of those are authoritarian, tell people what to do, have high expectations and be punitive when they don't meet those expectations, right? <laughs> All of the classic techniques that are used to like engage, manage and retain employees are not the techniques that, you know, uh, my dad enables. But I, I think that as a, as a child, it's even more complex because I think that parents always underestimate where their children are in their development. And, and I think that a lot of the times it wasn't, it wasn't ill intentions on my dad, but he struggled with, to give me the autonomy or the authority that I so desired. And as the oldest child, my, my natural inclination was to push the boundaries on both of those. And, and I think that as a, as a parent, and I think about this a lot when I think about raising my kids, where are the places that you can allow your children to fail in a constructive environment? I think that my dad and his love for me didn't want me to fail, but it also meant that it was a very constraining environment. And mm. I so deeply sought out independence and autonomy and there was no room for that with my dad yeah, yeah. uh i there was there was a lot of critique how about that there's a lot of similarities there uh <laughs> my i worked uh a summer for my dad i was a summer intern and i did a horrible job i was awful i was the worst but you know i, to I my would credit. also sorry you, you brought me on this topic now where you know you've won cocktail in my dad yeah. is also just very different in the business world i mean he is a true entrepreneur's entrepreneur i remember mm. after college i had all these extra school books and so forth and i was selling a few of them on uh, on amazon and um, he discovered that you could sell used books on the internet and he had a transportation company at warehouse space and all that kind of stuff and i kid you not the following weekend he showed up with three pallets of used books that he bought in an estate auction said let's put these on amazon this is a great business i bought these pallets for almost nothing and so, you know, within, within a year or two years, we had thousands of books. This was in the early 2000s when you could still kind of manually have an effective book reseller business. We had a small, you know, used book business on Amazon. But, but I'm the type of person that would have modeled out the spreadsheets and the profitability and created a business plan and thought all this through. <laughs> My dad is an entrepreneur's entrepreneur. He just was like, look, I can go buy three pallets of books for a couple hundred bucks and see if this works, right? Like yeah. there's very little cost and my son gets an education and he gets experience out of it. And who cares about the fact that, you know, he'd rather be watching football on a Saturday. I'm just going to make him sit in front of a computer and enter books into, into Amazon. See, Bree, you were seeing a glimpse and, and to the listeners and the viewers, you're getting a glimpse as to why I love Alex so much. Uh, you, he, he really turns his gears on everything, right? Every bit of a conversation he's turning his gears on and, and very thoughtful. Uh, yeah, just very thoughtful. I, I mean, personally, one thing that I always try to emulate in my parents is how hardworking they were. And we talked a little bit about the immigrant story, right? And how we should be, you know, celebrating, uh, immigrants on Thanksgiving and kind of the the melting pot that is America. And again, going back to this very hardworking mentality, something I try to emulate, but I look at Alex and he's someone who actually does it, right? He is really one of the hardest working and hardest thinkers in the venture capital game that I know. Um, And it's the only reason why um, it's not surprising to then hear that like, okay, despite being a varsity athlete for a nationally ranked Cal water polo team, and double majoring and working 20 plus hours a week to cover tuition costs. Um, Like he was the only person in his family to graduate from, from college. Like it's, it's always astounding to me, all the things that you do do uh, and that, and how hard you work. Um, Do all of your friends, I guess my question is how would all of your friends in college describe you if we asked them? That was a very roundabout question. This is the Negroni speaking at this point. No, I, 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 I think the unfortunate thing is a good question. The unfortunate thing is the best way to answer that question is to ask them and, yeah. 
and not to ask me. I, I, I would hope that they enjoyed my company in college and I, yeah. I would hope that they said that I was doing interesting things. I think for me, college was probably a discovery of stretching myself too thin across too many things. Mm. So when you, when you talk about the school, when you talk about the sports, when you talk about the work, I think I did some of those things not up to the caliber that I thought that I was capable. And the biggest takeaway for me from my college experience um, from a professional perspective was that when I graduated, I wanted to be most committed to my career and to strive that success. Um, and then simultaneously, while you know some of those experiences, um, I didn't have the extent of the success that I thought I was capable of, I'm still closest to my college, some of my college friends. I have one or two high school mm -hmm. friends that are at that same level, but I, my wife comments about it. The closeness of me and a few of my college friends is, is one of the just absolutely special things that, you know, a little plug here, the University of California Berkeley gave me is I, I, I got some people that um, are just such, such incredible human beings that I feel yeah. so close to. And I don't even know if at this point in time, they know what to say about me because, you know, after 30 years, what do you say about somebody what do you else? Say? <laughs> They're my friend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, do you have that strong closeness? So I'm very close with a number of the people that I played squash with at Vassar. Um, yeah. are you really close with your water polo? Yeah, I, I've, 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 I've three or four of my teammates where, you know, we, um, you know, we, we're on the phone every week. We have a WhatsApp yeah. group that doesn't, you know, there's not a day that there isn't chatter going yeah. back and forth yeah. in that WhatsApp group. I mean, the notifications are disabled because I can't have it sit on my table during a, you know, when we used to do in-person meetings, God knows sure. the things that get posted to that group. Sure. But, um, but the proximity of those relationships is, 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 is just incredibly deep um, and tight. And I'm really fortunate that two of those individuals live right here in the Bay Area. And then, you know, one of those people uh, unfortunately moved back to the, you know, uh, uh, the Hawaiian Islands, which is where they're from and oh. see him a little bit less, but see him more these days. Oh, which island? Uh, he's in Honolulu. So oh, we should all visit because Vic's sister just moved there and I she's know. got a guest house that's going to be available soon. So <laughs> he's got a, he's go got a guest there. house too. He we were all we were all we do a Tuesday night Zoom. He was on it last night. They were they were walking out to their boat ramp in their community and there was palm trees and there was waves uh -huh. and they were all in I shorts just left. Let's go, so, people. Look good I think we're me. all itching for this vacation. So we're going to go to Florida. For Thanksgiving, <laughs> then we're going to go to Hawaii for Christmas potentially, and yeah. just mm -hmm. uh, we'll join spend the Obamas. It out there. Mm -hmm. Why not? Why not? Yeah, um, did you get did you get your invite, Bree? Yet I haven't gotten mine yet. I'm, no, I, I'm I've been refreshing my I'm inbox. Waiting. Yeah, I know. I, I, I heard Michelle's behind party. this year. I was I the birthday party invitation ended up at my place in LA, so I missed uh, that one. So yeah. hoping for Christmas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I'm hoping that there isn't another three variants that come out so that we can actually get to a point. There's a lot of letters left in the alphabet, Vic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of letters oh, left in the alphabet. I want to go back to your, I, so you played water polo. I did I not did. know that. That's really yes. cool. Um, we were just watching water polo during the Olympics. Were you uh, into it? Is that, is that your sport? That's my sport. I'm into it. Yeah, no. I mean, I think what's really interesting is for so many years, um, I was, I was, I was a great high school player. I was a very okay college player, but was surrounded by, you know, a Cal, you know, um, I, I had friends, teammates, high school, college that went to the Olympics. And for many years, I knew so many of those people on a relatively personal level. And then the swimming program at Cal is also so exceptional that I knew a lot of the Olympic swimmers yeah. as well. And so for, you know, through the, through the many, many Olympics, probably through the mid 2010s, I knew a lot of the people competing or had been on the same pool decks and that community is not that large. We're finally reaching a point where my age, you know, I'm 39 years old, revealing. Uh, I now look at them and I'm like, ooh, those are young kids. There was two or three <laughs> Cal folks on that team. And I still do a lot with a Cal program from an alumni perspective. So I've I've met them. Um, and you know, I think they had a they had a they had a good Olympics. They didn't have a great Olympics. Um, I think that, you know, USA water polo is still a growing sport and it has more opportunity to grow. It's a sport that at the you know international level is very, very dominated by some of the Eastern European Italian and Greece. There's some I watched losing. him lose to, like, to Italy and Hawaii, and I was yeah. like, no, it was yeah. so close. But uh, <laughs> I, I think, you know, look, I, I'm super biased. I did it for 15, 20 years of my life. I think it's a great spectator sport. It's an hour. It's fast moving. Once you understand the rules, I understand they're complicated, but once you understand them, you know, you're like, oh, this is exciting to watch. I was going to say, I'm assuming your height gave you a huge advantage in the pool. 
Yeah, look, moving a, a big piece of, of, of um, you know, plank, like a big plank of wood through the waters, it's harder than moving a smaller plank of yeah. wood. And I played kind of, you know, I always explain it to people like I, I, I kind of played like a defensive role and so defensive center role. And so in basketball and like in, in water polo and like in basketball, there's a there's an offensive de- center and a defensive center. And so my my job was to keep guys like Shaquille O'Neal under control, which, you know, it, it's a tough job. They're usually Man. pretty darn good. It's- by the way, this is one of the things about, you know, because you have like the mainstream sports, you have like basketball, baseball, football, soccer, tennis, whatever, uh, water polo, squash, all these kind of like second tier sports that not a lot of people know about. By the way, squash is probably a tier below because we're in the Olympics yet, but require a hell of a lot of stamina. Uh, water polo is one of those things where your body is constantly moving because you're trying to keep yourself afloat. And then all of a sudden you have to worry about above the water what's going on with the ball and where you're at and having that the the court awareness right uh is it is there like a prototypical size because if you're too big again you're trying to move a lot and you're expending a lot of energy if you're smaller then you don't have a long enough arms uh i know this is totally off topic but i'm just wondering is there like a prototypical type I mean, I, I think water polo players do tend to, on the margin, be slightly uh, taller. Taller. Because that, that, that tight ha- size has some advantages. But, you know, much like how different sports go through different evolutions, they've really tried to speed up water polo. And so they're in the 90s. It was really dominant, much like basketball was with these just Ooh. beasts of human beings that were yep. just, you know. And then they really clamped down on some of the, the inner physical play. And it's moved the game to being a little bit faster. And so the most uh, prolific water polo player in US history is an individual by the name of Tony Azevedo. And mm. I, I mean, he's six or six, two or something like that. He's not short okay. by any means, he's not, but, uh, yeah. but he's not, he's not massive. And just like Steph Curry isn't massive, but you know, he just retired, but the things that he can do in the water are just absolutely stunning. And so yeah. I think that some of the, the, some of the most incredible players are just dynamic and the sport is definitely moving towards um, um, speed. Um, yeah. I think the rules have really encouraged that. And that means that the type of physical attributes that are most important also evolves. Uh, I want to jump into the FedEx envelope uh, as part of our VC unboxing, because it's timely for this conversation. Um, our hope. Yeah. Yes. Rip that bad boy open. Um my wife opened this one not knowing what it was because okay. um, she runs her business out of her home, which involves two to five FedEx envelopes per day. Sure. <laughs> and so she, I think, assumed this was for her because- Why doesn't the world it. stop for us, Brie? Why doesn't it stop for us? We do it all these does. nice things. I don't know what's going on. Constantly. Let's see what this is. <laughs> so that's what's in the box, I think, the big box. This reads the boy's first water polo net. Um, and it is a um, it is a water polo net, simple as that, uh, from the DWA AVC, Drinks with AVC uh, podcast team. Freaking yeah. awesome, guys. I love it. The kids are going to get super, super stoked about this. Um, yes. Shannon and you can uh, try and push the boys to the University of Oregon or Cal uh, depending on the alma mater, but <laughs> at least, uh, you know, Finn and Anders will have a starting point for their water polo careers. I, I think that's fantastic. I, I, I seesaw like every parent between really pushing my kids to solve my own, you know, uh, failures in the sports world, um, and thinking that they should just do whatever they love. So, you know, this will be one tool on the former and then, you know, we'll balance it with whatever is on the latter. Yeah. I mean, maybe they use the, the balls as they just throw them around and realize that they maybe, maybe I'll just put it there and soccer. they'll just naturally decide it's their favorite sport. And this is what they want to do with the rest of their life so that they can have conversations with their dad. Right. There you go. Just, exactly. I'll just casually leave it out and just see what happens. <laughs> so, uh, Alex, moving on from the athleticism and the the hard work that you put into college, I kind of wanted to, to get into you being the hardest thinker uh, as a VC. Um, you mentioned in our kind of pre-episode uh, questionnaire that you really enjoy intellectually complex and multi-threaded problems. 
And uh, anyone who's listening to this podcast and anyone who knows you personally, you know, 100% this, that describes you. Um, it, the other thing that I've noticed about you is that, and, and maybe that's part of it, the intellectually complex problem solver that you are, you're really good at surveying a marketing, a, a market landscape. Uh, and coming up with an investment thesis for that landscape. Can you, in a, in a short period of time, kind of tell our listeners, tell our viewers how you go about doing that? Well, I think maybe to answer your question of what I enjoy, um, I think that in careers, you can either choose to be an agent or a principal. And I think that that's an interesting dichotomy that everybody should think about. And I had somebody very early on my career present that to me when I was in an advisory capacity and we were an agent. And they, they, they described it on an income perspective. That is, uh, when an agent, your income is always going to be correlated with your book of business and it's going to be linear. Whereas when you're a principal, there's usually more risk early on. But uh, at some point in time, you have the ability to disconnect. Mm -hmm. um, that income aspect, I, I made more money when I was 25 than I thought I was going to make when I was 22 and I wanted to make when I was 50. And so I, like, I'm not financially motivated much, um, but the intellectual challenge is actually almost like identical to that, which is in the agency mm -hmm. business, you're always just thinking, can I pawn this problem off on somebody else? And in the principal capacity, you actually ask yourself, do I want to own that problem? And so in the investing business, you get this incredible opportunity to say, do I think this is a good opportunity? Not can I think about somebody else? And I, I take that to a very deep place uh, because I do think that there are people in my business that do a very good job, for example, of investing in businesses that, you know, are acquired or taken out along the way, which is probably part of my business as well, but they may never, you know, be remembered. And, and I don't care if businesses go public or acquired, but what I look for is businesses that are going to have some sort of sustainability to them and are going to mean something to somebody in a long place. And mm -hmm. so, I guess from an intellectual perspective, that's what stimulates and interests me. We at scale at a fundamental basis just think that the venture business is really well done by focusing on trends and markets. There's these tectonic shifts rippling through the industry at any point in time. You know, you think about the the, the move to SaaS um, and its predecessor models as a just kind of business model was a foundational mm -hmm. shift. Mm -hmm. The shift to the cloud, the shift to mobility. Um, and these things can can run for 10, 15 years. I mean, gosh, SaaS is really, you know, early 2000s, late 90s Absolutely. is where the formative pieces are. And we're still cashing in on it here. And when you get these trends right, when you get them right early, you don't have to be all that smart because yeah. the tidal wave is so big. But you, what you need to do is you need to understand which markets those trends are going to impact. And then within those markets, you need to understand the companies. And so when you ask, what is our workflow at Scale Venture Partners? What is Y workflow? I was fortunate to have a mentor early in my career that talked about getting geeked out on stuff. I like to get geeked out on stuff. And when I joined Scale, um, my partners who are all more experienced, more senior than me, you know, they were doing really interesting stuff and they looked at this vertical software stuff and they were like, well, this is like, you know, transportation and real estate and insurance. You know, this stuff is kind of boring. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't think they use those words, but uh, that's the gist of what I got from them. And, and, you know, partially opportunity and partially some of the experiences through my childhood and my dad's entrepreneurism, I was like, well, those industries could be interesting. And I started learning about them and I started getting geeked out on them. And, you know, lo and behold, I think my partners handed uh, me 60, 70% of the U.S. GDP with vertical industries, uh, the areas that I cover. And so I tell our, our young investment professionals, in my firm, like, come hang out with me in vertical software because I can't cover it all. And um, the educational process is 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 filled with with you know so one step back you right you you go find interesting pieces to read and you go read those pieces and you carve those out and you find interesting people you talk to listen to them and you build those you build those market maps out and you document your process and you document your theses and you bounce them off of people and 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 you collect feedback along the way um, the way yeah. that a machine learning algorithm does and. Ultimately, you hope that that knowledge that you get is enough in order for you to be competitive relevant in the industry, yeah. that you can either identify key opportunities before other people, or if you identify them at a similar time than other people, those entrepreneurs find that your knowledge um, makes you more attractive than other people that they've engaged with. Yeah. How, uh, what are you geeking out on now? Um, look, uh, 
<clears throat> we've probably as a firm had a more open mind about healthcare than we ever have had in the past and not healthcare in the broad general sense, but I don't think you can ignore 19% of GDP that'll explode and continue to grow. I think that our firm has been exceptional in business software and services, particularly anything with a SaaS or cloud model. And I think that we understand that business buyer as well as anybody, hopefully in the industry. And a lot of the healthcare um, has one problem, which is it doesn't make any fucking sense right? Yeah. Like the incentive structure is just all sorts of screwed up. A lot of Americans, and I think a lot of investors go into healthcare with the mindset of like, how do we improve patient outcomes? And I'm not sure that I fundamentally believe that our healthcare system is designed to increase or create better patient outcomes because they are not, you know, they're not the payer in the system. Mm -hmm. um, they're not the, the customer and they're not the constituency. And so we've done a lot of work around healthcare. That's probably the newest area that, um, We've arrest, invested around and done, but you look at my investment in ProShow, right? It's software pathologists. That sounds really fancy. It's technically FDA regulated. If you actually saw the application, because everybody already is making the face that you're making, Vic, right now, yeah. the application looks like Box. I mean, it is a content and file sharing system. Sure. For pathologists. pathologists are people who look through microscopes at dead skin cells or other body cells. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that we have digital microscopes now. We don't need to use the stuff that we used in high school in biology. And those create really big files, which then presents the problem of, well, where do those big files go? They also get created in sure. different formats. So you need a central viewer. Then you need to share those people. We need some workflow to, you know, work around those. And and and, and you're like, well, wait, 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 this is, I know we, we've invested in a box. We've invested in DocuSign. And so that's that's really our expression of healthcare. Um, I've probably been most active in insurance. That's a, that's a, just a key area of, of investment for me. I've loved financial technology since 2009, and I can talk a bit about that thesis, but, you know, insurance is this tangential asset management industry that sits right next to uh, financial technology, and there are so many VCs and investors that now understand fintech and invest there and will have opportunities, but when I think about like arbitrage of my knowledge relative to competitiveness of the landscape, the underinvestment insurance relative to the size of the category still creates just a tremendous amount of opportunity for an up and coming investor like me. So I like that. And, and then from there, prop tech and construction is, is a very vibrant area for me as well. You look at Spruce and Archipelago, they're kind of at that intersection of insurance and prop tech. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm really glad that you brought up SAS and SAS metrics. Um, yeah, I, I think if you talk about people um, that are ahead of their, their time in terms of thinking around SaaS and enterprise. Uh, there are a handful of people. I, th I think you're, you're one of them that I go to, to, to really get kind of what are the, what are the tailwinds, um, that are, that are coming, right? Um, we've seen massive changes in the, in the investment landscape. There's a ton of capital out there for seed deals. Um, and that has in turn kind of moved the goalposts for series A's and B's. You have companies and firms like scale that years back really wouldn't think about going very early stage. And now, you know, you're building out and, and have built out, uh, an early stage practice and you're going earlier and earlier. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the goalposts have moved for SaaS companies for the series A and where you believe kind of that, that, for lack of better words, the Goldilocks zone is for Series A company in SaaS? Um, I, I was just going to say that um, I, I feel the, the, the need for, for just a, a slight moment of scale venture partners marketing, which is we feel that we've been early stage investors um, basically since our outset. And we've always been exceptional investors and, and maybe uh, our VP of marketing will slap me for this, but terrible marketers. So I, I think we've always done those early, early in revenue deals throughout our history. And um, I, I think that we've just gained more of a reputation for that work, but we invested in box.com sub $5 million in ARR in 2009. And those are the same deals that we're doing today. Um, I think that we were a younger firm back then. And by the time people recognized us, our portfolio was more mature. And there was a perception that we'd invest in those companies later stage. And then simultaneously in 2009 and 2010, you could buy exact target at two times revenue at $60 million in ARR. And we thought that that was a good deal. And so we went out and bought that. Unfortunately, Insight and Tiger figured out that game really quickly and have completely eviscerated that opportunity. And so we're doing <laughs> less of that today, not because we think it's a bad business, but because we just have no competitive advantage there. And so 
I think we've been relatively consistent in our stage focus, and I just want to encourage uh, your listeners to understand that about us, which is we really like these early stage businesses that, you know, the chief product market fit. I think as it pertains to the goalposts, look, um, I think that the letters are actually something that the industry just needs to do away with. And we at Scale really don't try to talk about those letters because um, there was investors, and I've been in the industry long enough in 2005 and 2000 that were like, oh, we only do series A's or we only do series B's or whatever it may be. And entrepreneurs figured that out. And so they started creating seed rounds to really solve, you know, ignorance amongst entrepreneurs like sure. investors. And then you had, you know, mango seeds and pre-seeds and all the stuff that, you know, the explosion of the seed ecosystem has done. And so in my mind, you know, the stages are pre-product market fit, founder-led sale, um, um, kind of expansion, like professionalizing that go-to-market, and then pre-IPO, right? Those are the yeah. stages that exist in a company's lifestyle. And um, I think that more so than ever, the knowledge base available for people, I, I, you know, Jason Lemkin, who is another, you know, figure that um, has done a lot of public conversations, he used to say, if you get to a million dollars in ARR, you can get to $10 million in ARR. He said, the real struggle is get to a million dollars in ARR. Right. I think there's so much information these days, the volume of companies that get to a million dollars in ARR is kind of jaw dropping, right? Like right. that's not, that's not the identification anymore. It's how do you now, you know, scale that. And we frankly saw that at scale probably earlier than others, because we saw some of our companies yeah struggle scaling, yeah. uh, pun intended, from 10 to $20 million in ARR because they didn't have the processes and systems and things in place. And so where do I think the venture ecosystem is going? Look, I, I think that the, the earliest stages of the vi- ecosystem are as vibrant as ever. There's 500 seed funds that you can work with and you should find yeah. the right folks for you. And I think that in those pre-IPO, I'm going to buy my IPO allocations by buying you post $20 million in ARR. Every private equity fund, hedge fund, mutual fund, sovereign wealth fund suddenly, you know, is calling on Vic and I to go run their practices, right? Like there's no shortage of jobs and funds launching there. Um, um, those opportunities exist. But I think that journey from, you know, a founder-led sale to, to a, a repeatable go-to-market motion that isn't founder-led, that's still a tough journey. And it's always been a tough journey because because you you're forced to do one of the most difficult things right which is transfer knowledge experience and relationships from a founder to people who don't aren't part of that founding journey and we Mm. we try to help companies at scale through that transition because it's never obvious and it's never easy though there are some repeatable lessons what's the best one best principle that you would give to SaaS companies um from your observations at scale yeah um I talk about this a lot. When we invest, we generally tell companies to um, mature their business processes, particularly as it pertains to metrics, reporting, board communications, and so forth. There are things that CEOs and founders don't love, and they think that they are not valuable. And to some degree, they're right. They're not the first priorities in the business. Um, I took a few flying lessons. I never got a flying lesson. Uh, I never got a pilot's license early in my career. But the metaphor that I that I that I give people that seems to work is. Um, is when you're flying a really small Cessna plane, you can visually inspect that airplane and then you can get up in the sky and you can fly line of sight, right? You can look out the cockpit and you make sure you don't run into anything. You can see the weather patterns. You can see any sort of emerging situations evolve. As the size of plane and the complexity of the distance that you're flying increases, um, two things happen. First, because of the speed of that plane, problems just creep up much faster. And then Mm -hmm. small deviations in your direction or your altitude or whatever can compound really, really quickly, which means that you need to switch over to instruments because you need more information. And so when we invest in companies, the first thing that we do before we've even invested between term sheet and closing is we start educating them on what we think um, are best practices, which isn't, you have to use all these, but what are best practices and what we've learned around instrumentation, right? Like how do we manage our business? How do we report? What are all these things? And we found that the businesses that do most well, uh, that's probably really poor English, are the businesses that get a grasp on that really quickly because it allows them to rapidly make adjustments. And most frequently that adjustment is actually investing more in their business, right? Like, ooh, things are going really freaking well. We should spend more money, right? Um, But but doing that in a vacuum or trying to do that with visual line of sight just by talking to your lieutenants tends to not scale. And so it's it's, it's an obvious insight and it's an insight that no CEO has ever said when we're undergoing that journey. Gee, Alex, I really enjoy doing this with you. Um, and they rarely admit a couple of years later that they appreciated us doing it, but they keep doing it afterwards, which I think is the largest compliment we can get. Yeah. 
Oh, so on that note and talking about metrics, uh, I know you wanted to plug scale and you already have, but we're going to give you another opportunity. Oh. Uh, scale just uh, announced, obviously, their $400 million uh, fund. 600. Six, 600. 600. Yeah. $600 million fund six. Yeah. Uh, and along with that, they announced Scale Studio, which is a SaaS benchmarking tool that allows you to uh, evaluate your company's performance against a, a database of cloud companies uh, at a similar stage of growth. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your involvement there and just generally kind of, this is a tool that's open to the public, right? Uh, you know, what does the offering look like and, and how should founders kind of weigh the insights that they get from, from that tool? Yeah, I, I think, look, very simply for those founders that are listening to this podcast, uh, Google Scale Studio, you'll get the right URL and it'll allow you to uh, input some of your data and get insights into your business. That is take you from, you know, visual line of sight um, into, into instrumentation. And I think it comes from a core problem, which we saw as companies were transitioning from this founder led sale to a professional repeatable go to market machine, which is they didn't understand whether it was working or not and whether they were doing the right things. And a lot of the boards that we were on were filled with really talented people that were using anecdotes or subjective opinions to report back to those executives. And we at scale, while we think that our opinions are absolutely wonderful, um, are probably more data-driven and quantitative than some other folks in our industry. Mm -hmm. um, and we wanted to be really, really, really honest in the way that we answered those questions is really the best way that I can describe what happened. And so many years ago, we hired an individual on our team, Dale Chang, who runs portfolio operations for us. He's exceptional. He came out of the Alexander Group, which basically does go-to-market consultation. And as many firms have provided many different value-add services to their portfolio companies, we decided for us, our edge wasn't around you know, recruiting or some sort of business development. Um, Brie, what you do is wonderful. It's, it's not a critique. It's just we had to figure out a way to solve the problems for our companies, our stage. And the questions were always like, is what I'm doing working, right? Like, like all right, yeah. I implemented your dashboard, but now, like, is it working? And so we aggregated data across our portfolio, across our past portfolio, across our close relationships, across public companies. And we concluded that nothing off the shelf worked. And so we invested a lot of money. We've been investing a lot of money for a lot of years. One of the things that you start develop, like learn when you develop software is you put together a budget. It's a big budget. And then there's a subsequent annual budget to maintain that piece of software, which we never put in our own budget, which is ironic because we invest <laughs> in software companies. But now that we're, you know, half a decade plus into the software system, we can quantitatively answer things for you. And so if you would like to know, um, you know, <clears throat> let's say you're going to be between five and $10 million in ARR next year, and you'd like to know how much to spend on R&D or sales and marketing, we can look at all companies in our data set, which, you know, is probably going to be like, I don't know, 37 or 57 at that point. And we can tell you um, that data set, or if you want to know, you know, compensation for your account executives relative to your SDRs or quota. And so the entrepreneur then says, hey, I'm top quartile, bottom quartile, I'm median. We're not as the investor or the board member saying, this is what you should do. We're just saying for companies that have been on an IPO trajectory, this is the data set. Um, you may have good reason to be in or outside of this data set. And so my previous portfolio company, Scout, RFP, we sold it to Workday, successful outcome. On R&D spend, they were always like bottom quartile, if not below. They were just super underinvesting in R&D. And so usually that would lead you to believe, man, these guys need to hire more engineers. It turns out they didn't have a single engineer in the US. Their model was based on Eastern European uh, engineering prowess, cost arbitrage. And so the metric was misleading, yeah. right? And so that's the classic example of where data just helps you interpret the situation. Simultaneously, um, we had an improving market. Like we looked at sales efficiency and it continued to improve. And we were also bottom quartile in sales and marketing investing. And while our sales efficiency was around median to inching in a top quartile, it was steadily improving. And I was like, guys, we need to invest more on sales and marketing, accelerate our growth. Turns out Workday, you know, like that accelerated growth. And, you know, the founders said, hey, we should probably sell this thing. I was like, maybe we should IPO. And they were like, no, we should, we should go <laughs> no. for the sale. And, no, and you know, that. yeah. that's part of the job. Yeah. But actually, I'm really proud of them. So I don't, yeah. yeah. And you have a lot to be proud of, right? This has been like a hot girl summer for you. You like the memes. Yeah, yeah. You know the summer. I, I've seen some of those in my uh, in yeah. my um, yeah. in my feed. 
So for for the I'm, I'm not quite. There's a couple of venture capitalists that are really good on the Twitter memes. I mean, kudos to them. That's a yeah. That's yeah. a whole day job that I I don't have time for. But well, and so look, a, I don't mean and, that in like the like the diminishing. I'm like, oh, you're good. You're good. I wish I yeah, had that marketing yeah. prowess. And for listeners and and viewers, right, that might not know what Hot Girl Summer is, uh, Megan V. Stallion, uh, who coined the term, uh, basically said it's just about women and men just being unapologetically themselves, uh, having a good ass time, hyping up, your, hyping up your friends, doing you and not giving a damn about what nobody got to say about it. Uh, and it's really just, again, this breezy feeling, I think scale uh, with the $600 million on six uh, studio, all great. But then here's Alex. He's got two companies, which he sits on the board of uh, Keep Trucking and Spruce. Uh, they announced massive uh, raises in June. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's in store for both of those companies going forward? I know, yeah, you can go into the weeds, but I think if you were going to be your, your best marketer and your best biz dev person, what would you say for, for Keep Trucking and Spruce? Um, I, I would say that the transportation and particularly the trucking industry is the largest employment category in 45 or 47 of the states in the United States. And Keep Trucking is the leading bottoms up um, software company for those. It's led by a CEO who is an exceptional operator combined with somebody who has just wildly ambitious uh, vision of what they can solve. And um, uh, it, it, I can't share the ARR numbers, but they're really freaking big. Like we could have been public yeah. yesterday yeah. Uh, and I could have shared the growth and you've been like, oh, they would have been public for a lot of money. And I, I sit here and wonder whether it's still an underappreciated asset that the industry doesn't quite get. We just had a board meeting last week and we told the new investor that did that, you know, $2 billion or $3 billion round, whatever it was. And we're like, whoa, you got to steal, right? Like that's how good the quarter was. <laughs> um, and he shrugged his shoulders and just smirked and smiled. So, um, you know, what's in store for them? Look, a company of that scale, um, sustaining growth, continuing to invest. Um, and then at some point in time, considering the public markets as an avenue, um, I think those are the, the obvious things. Um, from a product perspective, they released um, and publicized some of the things that they're doing on their camera uh, side that are really, really exciting and continue to just explode the TAM, which people continue to think is small. And then they, you know, I, like I always remind people like there was five winners in marketing automation and that's like a 15, $20 billion category, sure. right? Like, mm -hmm. I think we have a very, like we do, we do a very bad job of looking at relative market sizes sometimes. And then, you know, as it pertains to Spruce, um, God, I like Patrick. I don't know. The CEO there is, is, um, is 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 just a a truly understated individual ex betterman which is a company that i truly admire and his product mm -hmm. i use as well and i think patrick has a vision of of um reinventing the digital real estate closing experience he's done actually a number of podcasts and you should listen to what they're doing it's a company that grew so rapidly over the last 12 months. It's a company that I invested in a month before COVID lockdowns. It was very enthusiastic. It had been on my quote unquote, you know, hot girl list or whatever you want to call it for like a few years. And when Patrick finally gave me the chance to invest, I was like, boom, let's go. And then COVID hit. And, you know, usually when you have a recession, real estate gets hit. And I called my partners and I said, hey guys, I think this is the right investment. They're not losing a lot of money, but we may we may not look smart for 12 or 18 months here. So just bear with me. And then interest rates changed, the refinancing boom happened and you know, 10, 15 X revenue growth year over year from not an insignificant base. What do they have in store? Look, uh, they're probably a couple of years behind a company like Keep Trucking, not from a revenue perspective, but just from a maturation of business. And so we just raised a really wonderful round from Zig that we actually, they were, Believe it or not, because we because of COVID, we paused a bunch of our investment because we were so afraid. And mm. so we were actually profitable for the back half of last year at Spruce. And so we're figuring out how to spend the money. And we as much raised that money because Zig was an existing investor. They were enthusiastic about it. And we thought it was a good milestone for the business. 
but also just thinking very long term about the technological investments that we need to do in order to fulfill mm -hmm. our investments. And for anyone that's ever bought a home, you know, you have all the enthusiasm of, of or, or tried to refinance a home. You have the, all the enthusiasm of locking in that rate or, or getting that, that, that home, you know, in, under LOI or whatever. And then you have that closing process. And it is, yeah. it is terrible. It's one of my partners who just bought a new home called me and said, after he went through that process, he's like, wait a minute, if this is the status quo, he's like, I feel really good about this venture. Fund. I think Bruce is going to do well. Yeah. 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 Cause he's, he's like, can I use Spruce? And we distribute through a different model than residential real estate agents. And I was like, that's not really what Spruce does, but you know, he's yeah. like, yeah. And he's like, my title company was just terrible. I, I mean, I love those instances where uh, as investors, you get a chance to glimpse at the status quo and it's always a, oh, oh, this is, this is the, again, this it just serves as the a stark reminder of why you invested in the company that's disrupting that status yeah. quo, right? It's just, I think that's one of the, the nicest feelings that we get as investors, um, okay, we're going to play a little game. Uh, it's inspired by Hot Girl Summer. Uh, Hot Girl I'm going to give you, yeah, uh, Bree and I are going to give you a subject matter. And then you are going to tell us if that subject will continue to have a Hot Girl Summer or if things are going to cool off and why. All right. Uh, the first one, I'll go first. A16Z. Gosh, you went straight for the throat. Jeez, are we going to do Inside <laughs> and Tiger throat. right after this? Uh, isn't, isn't there like a... Actually. <laughs> no, look, uh, I think as a venture capitalist, I, I, I now have to be very, very tactful. Yeah. Look, here's here's the truth about Andreessen, right? I think if you'd asked venture capitalists five years ago um, at some sort of networking event, they they would have all said polite things to your face and then and and then whispered to each other, right? Because anytime somebody <laughs> new enters and and delivers the type of force that Andreessen has to the ecosystem, um, you know, it just creates jealousy from from people and and suspicion, and they also wrapped around with a ton of marketing. But I think what we can say at this point in time is that their returns, at least around the first few funds has just been tremendously yeah. positive. And I think their LPs are very supportive, which means that they're going to be in business as long as they want to be. And then on the marketing side, I think that they have fundamentally shifted the business. You know, the, the thing that I find most fascinating about them is I grew up in the venture industry at a time where there was a move towards um, entrepreneurs wanting independence, right? They didn't want, they didn't want controlling board members. They didn't, um, they didn't want people meddling in their business. And then Andreessen came uh, into the business and they called it value add, right? It was like, it was like the greatest yeah. marketing trip ever. It was like, Hey, we're going to get all up in your business, but it's going to be quote unquote value add. And entrepreneurs started asking me in meetings, like, well, what's your value add? And I, like my head exploded. I was like, wait, I thought you wanted the opposite. I thought you wanted me to leave them alone. <laughs> Yeah. But I think they've done a good job on their stock picking. Um, and, and I'm super enthusiastic about how they're leaning into things like uh, healthcare and crypto and all those things. Mm -hmm. You know, interestingly, if I'm being really blunt in, in my business, I just don't run into them very much. And so they're somewhat of a, a non-factor to me other than that their marketing presence makes them a very known. And so if I, if I have to ask, answer your question, I think they're going to continue to have a hot girl summer. I think what they're doing is freaking good and they're well run. I mean, kudos to the principles there. Okay. I, I will say this tiger and inside venture partners were two and three on, on the next question, but Bree, let's skip them. Let's go to the, to the rest of them. All right. I'll go with, uh, SoftBank Robotics. Soft or, just, or, or just SoftBank. SoftBank, SoftBank or, or Soft, Soft Bank. Robotics. We have a portfolio company, Soft Robotics, and we have SoftBank, the firm. Let's go with SoftBank. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go with um, Falls Coming Soon. Is that the way Ooh. to answer that question? Um, look, I think that SoftBank, in all of their brilliance, said that if you have unlimited capital you can do incredible things in the industry and then softbank discovered something which is they don't have unlimited capital and so they needed to start accessing other capital sources which made them dependent on the capital markets and anytime that you're dependent on the capital markets you are exposed to volatility massively especially when you're le as leveraged as they are yeah 
All right. It's, that was, see, we're not pulling any punches here. And I'm, you're playing like along. It. This is fantastic. Um, how about, I'm going to take it to Florida. What about Miami? Is that going to continue to have a hot girl summer or is Miami going to fizzle out? Oh, it's going to totally fizzle out. Um, not because Miami is an incredible and it isn't a wonderful city and not because it isn't going to have growth in technology, but because what's really happening right now is a few luminaries moving to a few places and doing yeah. a, uh, you know, it's like a, it's like a, confirmation bias right like you got to burn the bridge mm. when you've gotten there um and and i have been an advocate look i invested in people matter in charleston north carolina in like 2013 i've been an advocate for you know the world is flat thomas friedman stuff democratization of technology for over a decade and the explosion of it, miami has me as excited as the next person but to say that like miami is going to replace san francisco and everybody's going to miami and all this madness it just seems silly to me like i mm. i don't i don't even know why miami would want to replace san francisco <laughs> and um and and just like everybody moved to san francisco and then quote unquote left everybody's going to move to austin or or miami and then they're going to move somewhere else when the next hot thing you know like mm. like like these things are cyclical, right? Like baggy jeans are back in, or is it 80 jeans? I don't know. You tell me, Brie. I'm still wearing the same jeans I wore 10 years ago. Me too. I hope baggy jeans aren't back in. This is the same yeah. conversation that I have with Laura. Dude, about but, but Vic, you look, you look good in some skinny jeans. Are you sure? I like skinny. No, I like skinny yeah, jeans. It's, a, yeah, it's the bell-bottom cool. jeans. Ask, ask my wife. Brie knows this. We've had this conversation. I really don't like boot cut and and bell bottom jeans. I just don't. Yes. I don't know when when Vic and I go deep on topics, it's usually around jeans, especially a uh, baggy it? cut. I All right. So so I, I hear you, Vic, but like boots are pretty legit. And when you throw on a pair of boots, you understand a slightly wider like a boot cut. How do you feel about a boot cut jean? I'm not a fan. No fan. I'm not gonna I, lie. I don't think you have the right boots, Vic. We gotta go boot shopping. Bree, you got your boots. You're out in Colorado. Oh, I have boots. I have lots yeah. of boots. You've, you've got the yeah. boot cut jeans, though. Bree is yeah. actually, I mean, from a fashion perspective, I trust Bree and my wife more than I trust myself sometimes. So, yeah. That's a good what one. else? Hot girl summer. Keep them, keep them going. Hot girl All summer. Right. Uh, okay. Um, so, prop tech and real estate tech, they've clearly they've been the bells of the ball. I know you talked a little bit about Spruce. Um, but uh, like heading more into prop tech. Oh, like we're not, it's not even hot girl summer. We're like, we're like, you know, when like it's February and like you finally see like one of your seeds poking out a little bit of greenness and you're like, oh, yeah. this could become a massive tree. That's yep. where we are in prop tech. I mean, I, if I think about maturation of industries, I think about FinTech, then I think about insurance and I think about prop tech after that, mm -hmm. you know, look, real estate is one of the largest asset classes in this country. The innovation has just been absolutely abysmal. We're seeing tectonic shifts in population in the United States. And we're also seeing massive shifts in, in what we do with those properties. Uh, it, like, I mean, if you talk about like single family residential homes, the 2009 financial crisis basically mm -hmm. turned um, all single family residential homes into something that folks like Blackstone can now trade and turn into. And so there's a lot of stuff going on in that industry that is, is really, really transformative. And we've only started scratching the surface of what's going on there. Not all of it is actually going to benefit the American consumer, which makes me really sad. There's a lot of regulation that is causing housing shortages it's causing mm -hmm. price inflation in these hard assets but given that those are facts and our politicians are unlikely to change those rules it creates just tremendous startup opportunities so just as a follow-up to that question I, I think you bring up a lot of great uh, spot on i think i agree with a lot of what you said my question is do you have to change your mindset as an investor because you mentioned inflation you mentioned a lot of macroeconomic kind of um, waves and and influences that that really shift the market pretty dramatically. Do you have to change your mindset as an investor from you know venture capitalists in X, Y, and Z verticals to then prop tech, or this is the same stuff? You just got to get used to regulation. Same, same, same stuff. I mean, I, I think um, in vertical industries, almost every one of my companies touches regulation, mm -hmm. whether it be root insurance with the insurance commissioners or keep trucking, which is the truck mandates around ELDs, 
or approach it with the FDA. And so regulated environments are very common for the environments that I operate in, which is interesting, right? Because when I started investing in the mid 2000s, it was like, you didn't touch regulated industries. That was, a, that was like something that my early mentors, the venture taught me. But um, I think everybody's changed their tune about that. Um, but maybe asking is a slightly more nuanced one. And maybe if this isn't the question, it's nevertheless an interesting one because I think about it a lot. I think the real estate markets are changing in their behavior. And some of the business models that we see don't have the classic technological differentiation, but they are um, supported by substantive um, trends in the way that um, things are going to evolve. Like I think that the introduction of institutional buyers in single family residential homes is changing the way that we all purchase homes, which means Ooh. that it puts um, you and I, when we go in and say, hey, we want to buy this home, afterwards we need to do an inspection, we get a loan. Well, that's a very uncompetitive advantage to a large institutional buyer that's like run an algorithm and says this home's worth $400,000 and, you know, we'll close, you know, if you sign this, we'll close 48 hours from now. And a seller's like, wait a minute, which of these two do I want to take? One has lower certainty, the other one has higher certainty. And so um, we all need to be more competitive. And so like cash offers are increasingly a big thing, right? Um, and maybe the companies that are delivering that don't have the technological edge, but you have an immense amount of certainty that the way that we all relate to our mortgage providers and the way that we do bids is going to evolve drastically. And I think that as an investor, you just need to decide how much exposure you want to businesses that are more sales and marketing driven mm -hmm. versus businesses that have true technological advantages. And I don't know that uh, at the venture fund level, either one is the right move, but I think that as an investor, you need to consider both of those and, yeah. and, and have confidence around that level of exposure and think about it in that way. Well, I wanted to just point out, and this is Hot Girl Summer segment over. Um, I want to go to you personally, Alex. Um, when we do our research for this show, we go through Twitter accounts, social media, et cetera. And I will have to say, you are one of the funniest VC Twitter accounts I have seen. And I've been on VC Twitter for like, you know, whatever, eight years. And with the, with, you know, I think you should have more of a following. I'm surprised that you're not as known in VC Twitter because you're seriously hilarious. We'd like to highlight a couple of tweets. Okay. Um, Vic, you've got one. You've yeah, got one yeah. You. Yeah. So very recently, August 12th, uh, someone said, I'm not going to say their name. Someone said, there is a world of difference between being a small VC investor getting allocation and compelling companies as part of a syndicate versus an investor who can win and lead financing, financings in those same companies. Many who are good at the former are raising funds, assuming they can do the latter. To that, you responded, there's also a lot of the latter trying to do the former. That's, that's right up my power alley of humor. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, and by the way, as you know, subtle, subtle, but direct, keep going. Yeah. yeah no, no. I, so I'm, I'm a part of a, a smaller fund, right. Yep. I, you know, and uh, trying to make my way and, and play with the big boys and, and, and in the world of venture. Um, so I, I kind of appreciate you saying that. Um, but I think some people might be taken back, first of all, at your take on it. Also, you're at scale. It's, again, like you said, $600 million fund six. Um, can you just dive it a little bit into what you meant by that? Um, look, I, I think there's a lot of people in this environment trying a lot of different strategies in order to be competitive because it's a hyper-competitive environment. And I don't fault anyone for the things that they're doing. But um, I think that we tell, one of the funny things is we tell as, as VCs, we tell our portfolio companies to stay focused. Mm -hmm. In the venture business, um, most venture firms um, naturally through time defocus themselves. And I think there's a real cost to that. And there's a few firms that are wildly successful at being defocused, but most of the great venture firms are actually quite focused. And yeah. we try to stay focused at scale, not only because we think that it relates and, 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 and provides better returns, but it also probably makes us better board members to our portfolio companies. Sure. I had the fortunate experience early in my career at Crosslink of launching a seed fund inside of a larger venture fund. And you know, we wrote 28, 29 checks, exposed $7 million. It was a significant in a two-month period. 
And, um, and the whole idea was let's get exposure to these companies at an earlier stage so that we can then, you know, put money into their later stage rounds. And people always talk about like the signaling effect. I actually think that's a bunch of horseshit. You want to go take money from, I don't know, we talked about Andreessen Horowitz. You want to go take money from their seed program? I'll write you up later. I don't, I don't care if Andreessen invests or not. If you're a good company, I, I, I'm capable of independent thought. But I, I think there's a there's a there's this there's this there's this notion in the industry that we can all like buy access or we can buy relationships, and I kind of call bullshit on that. Like I think these like I, th I think that removes a lot of credit from these entrepreneurs. And uh, from launching that program, I can tell you when you when you're managing a twenty million dollar position, and you're also managing five three hundred thousand dollar positions, you spend almost no time on the three hundred thousand dollar positions. And so what actually we discovered across like, and a lot of venture firms I've talked to have discovered this as well. You know, the subsequent financing rounds come up and you end up missing them because the entrepreneur either, you know, he's busy, he forgets about you, he's got something else going on, he didn't think you got the attention you deserve from you, or or whatever it may be, right? Or yeah. you don't have enough information and you're an insider. So you have some information, you're almost like blinded by that information. And so um for all the funds that are, have seed programs and are trying to compete with you, Vic. I like, I give them kudos by all means they should do it, but I don't know that it's an obvious strategy to success. I think it's yeah. just, it's just a strategy. Um, yeah. And so um, I, I think it's arrogant to say that scale would be exceptional at pre-seed investing when we have no experience in it. And you, that's what you do all day long, Vic, right? Like what gives us the right to think that we would be better at it than you uh, when we have never done it before? Well, I mean, I think there's also this question of everyone and their mom is trying to raise a fund, it feels like, uh, and particularly at the seed stage. And I think I'm really on the fence to whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, I love the access that it brings to just entrepreneurs in general. But then at the same time, I think that, um, and this is not to sound conceited at all, but I, I don't know if all of those folks that are trying to raise a fund should be fund managers and realize what it takes to be seed investors. So I, I find myself on the fence a lot on that. Do you, where are you on that? Um, for me, the a telltale sign is always when people talk about their desire to be in this business is, is all about the entrepreneur. And I'm super pro entrepreneur and I don't want to take away that, that I love that aspect of the business, but I think we need to remind ourselves that we're in the asset management business. We have a responsibility, a fiduciary one to our LPs. Yeah. And if we really, really want to be totally brutal, um, you know, we provide a product to those LPs and they're our customers and, and specifically they pay us and in return, we give them a return. And so when people don't talk about that aspect of the business ever, that's always an alarm bell for me on whether they still want to do it in 10 years. Because if, if all you care about is the, the entrepreneurial part of this business, there are a lot of ways in order to work with those entrepreneurs to get that exposure and to help those people. Yeah. Um, and, and as much as I like that aspect of the business, I do also realize that I am an asset manager and I have a, I have a fiduciary responsibility or LPs as well. And so, you know, I think much like you, I love the amount of capital that's come in the industry. I love where we are right now. I love the evolution. I'm so excited to see what this industry is in 10 years. Um, I, I much like everybody else in the industry, I'm seeing my business competitively threatened everywhere and it's challenging <laughs> me. And there are nights where it's like, Ooh, that's tough. I had an entrepreneur an hour before this phone call tell me that, you know, somebody larger was willing to write a larger check at a larger valuation and how I felt about that versus my bid. And, you know, I, I felt shitty, right. I told him you yeah. might want to take that money, but I also told him that I thought I was pretty great and he should sleep on it for a night. So that dynamic is real in the industry and it's exciting for entrepreneurs and I support all of that. I also think that anytime anything is very vibrant, you know, not everybody, like I, the one thing that I can do to every one of my entrepreneurs is I can tell them that I wrote my first venture check in 2005. It's 2021 right now. I've been with my firm for nine years. I am, you know, full stack partner in this organization. And I would be disappointed if I wasn't still in this business 20 years from now and I, I wasn't with my firm. And so if you want con continuity and consistency in somebody who knows who they are, that is something that you get from me. And it's not clear to me with everybody else that that is the case. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, let's bring up one final tweet. Bree, do you want to jump on that? Yes, because I really liked this one. Um, let me pull it up. Sorry. Um, okay this tweet. We're seeing three zero-sum strategies concurrently tested in venture in real time. Hire everyone, A16Z. Do every deal, Tiger. 
Where's every LP dollar in sight? That was a real funny one. I like that. Where are we yeah. going with that? Yeah, what, what was you the thinking? inspiration for that tweet? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think the inspiration was watching three firms successfully, mind you, execute three strategies. And, and I actually, I'm going to be generous to A16Z because you asked about them earlier. But, um, you know, different people have different motivations. We talked about how everybody talks about the entrepreneur. But I, I think that um, the brilliance of each of those firms is, is different, right? In the case of Andreessen, it's huge organization that does all of these things that gains them just huge prominence and it makes them very attractive to entrepreneurs. The brilliance in, in Tiger Global, um, which is a very recent phenomenon, yeah. is that they're just, they're basically creating index funds and they're doing it on a very different fund cycle and at a very different cost of capital than the rest of the industry, right? Mm -hmm. So if you raise funds every 12 months because you have more of a head fund structure they do, during an upmarket environment, which is what we've had for the past decade and particularly during the last few years, doing lots of deals because everything's getting marked up makes you look super brilliant. And I think the very interesting thing with Tiger, you saw them get really um, um, cautious in the Q2 of last year, 2020, is what happens during a down market cycle. Now, um, if that down market cycle, I actually think their model is just not, it's not at risk to low valuations, it's at risk to big changes in valuation. Right. And so can they punch out five funds that do really well? And then one fund just totally gets whacked because it was during a, you know, a time when the market swung in the wrong direction. And maybe the LPs don't care because they're like, ah, the previous five funds were good. Average is that I'm great. You know, the first time new LP in that fund might not feel great, but you know, it's the same role that many eons ago in a different capacity NEA played, right? Move big dollars right. in the industry. And maybe I won't quite have the, the cash multiple or the IR as other people in the industry, um, but there's value. In that. And then in Insight, look, um, we co-invest with Insight almost as much as anybody in the industry. And so um, when, I, when, I, when I say these things jokingly, there's, there's a whole lot of admiration for these firms. And the brilliance of Insight was, you know, you go to the Texas retirement system and they say, well, we really want venture exposure. We read that EL case study and we want alternative assets. Also, we'd like to write a $150 million check. <laughs> and as, 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 as um, Vic highlighted, we're a $600 million vehicle. We're like, hey guys, we don't have anybody over 10%, you know, let alone a $150 million check. That's like 25%. Yeah. And so Insight was like, no, 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 guys, everybody in the venture industry has it wrong, right? Raising more money is actually easier than raising less money. And so they went to these very large institutional sources that wanted venture exposure, didn't want to work through a fund to fund manager and said, we'll get you venture exposure. And their returns have been tremendous. All three funds that mentioned that tweet, uh, returns have been you know, tremendous, probably as good yeah. as ours or anybody else's. So I have nobody to critique right now. The interesting thing is, what do those models do over a decade, the way that they're sure. expressing themselves right now? And in the case of Insight, um, you know, I think they're probably betting for a lower IRR than a dedicated focused fund like ourselves, but they're saying mm -hmm. there's a set of LPs that want venture exposure, don't want to work through fund to fund managers, and we can make them happy. And we as, as investors on the other side of that bet should be really, really wary of that because um, anybody that has a lower cost of capital and is competing for the same deals can be more competitive than you. And so I I think what they're doing is pretty brilliant. And also um, we don't have private jets as venture partners. $600 million doesn't get private jets. All three funds that I mentioned have private jets, I'm pretty darn sure. And so who am I to, you know, write snarky, cynical tweets about people that are flying around in private jets? I'm probably just jealous. I mean, but that's also what I love about you. Uh, you just really don't take yourself so seriously. You're a serious human being that has some serious thought behind everything that you say, but you just don't take yourself so seriously. And I, well, I you guys are great. It. Like, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I, I wonder if some of them are going to be in business in a decade from now. Maybe they'll make so much freaking money that they get out of the business. I'd like to be yeah. in, the in a decade doing the yeah. same thing if possible. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, do you have time to play five questions with us? I do have time to play five questions. I also, Vic, um, we have two more bags. Yeah, mm -hmm. we actually, mm -hmm. Vic, we should probably skip five questions and hit the bags. How about we do both? We do them quickly. I'll do really quick. Can we do the five questions? Long. I think they're kind of long though, Vic. Yeah. Go quick. But they're, quick. But they're short, short answers. They're, they're short, short answers. answers. I'll go super okay, short. Right. Make the questions let's, right. let's, let's, let's shoot it out. Go ahead, Bree. Let's, Bri. let's do with... three out of the five. All right. I, okay. I'll do the first You do three. One. I like All the right. first one. Someone invented the dream VCR. It allows you to tape an entire evening's worth of your own dreams, which you can then watch at your own leisure. However, when you watch your dreams, you must do so with your family and friends in the same room. 
they get to watch your dreams along with you. And if you don't agree to this, you can't use the dream VCR. Would you still do this? No. <laughs> <laughs> that simple. That's simple. All right. Number two, uh, let's assume you meet a magician. He can do five simple tricks. He can pull a rabbit out of his hat. He can make a coin disappear. He can turn the ace of spades into a joker card and two other in a very similar vein. But these are his only tricks and he can't learn anymore. But he can, but the reality is, is that he can do these five tricks with real magic. He's legitimately magical. Uh, is this person more impressive than Albert Einstein? No. Okay. All right. This is how we should do all of our, uh, know, we should right? do all five and just, uh, very, yes and no. Very, right, very we'll quickly. Do, we'll do all five. No, no, very quickly. Uh, he's impressive, but he's not a creative in some and different. Mm, okay. I agree. I agree. Solid. I agree. I thought me. about that one a lot. You meet a wizard in downtown San Francisco. The wizard tells you that he can make you more attractive if you pay him money. When you ask how this process works, the wizard points to a random person and that's on the street, probably a homeless guy. You look at the random stranger and the wizard says, I'm now going to make them a dollar more attractive. He waves his magic wand. As far as you can tell, nothing has changed about this person, but somehow they are a little bit more attractive and you can tangentially, or you can tell that they're more attractive. The wizard has a weird rule though. You can only give him one lump of sum. You can't keep paying him over and over again. You can just pay him once. How much cash do you give the wizard? I don't, I walk away. You walk away. Walk away. So two, two reasons. First of all, people asking me for money in San Francisco, especially those that tell me they're a wizard. I, I don't just walk away. I briskly walk away. I've been in the city for 15 years. Yeah. Um, for, for listeners that live in San Francisco, I, you read all the tweets about like you just as a San Franciscan, you, you, you understand how to deal with people that identify themselves as wizards amongst the streets. Yeah. Uh, and, and the number two rule, I, I think this was before the... I don't know. I'm comfortable in my own skin. I am who I am. Like at this Love time it. in my life, I don't need to be more or less attractive. Uh, I know that it's a, it's a slow slide downwards. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> slow it. slide downwards. It's all I'm downhill. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, here we go. You've won a prize. Uh, forget Starlink. The prize has two options. You can choose uh, either, but not both. The first option is a year in Europe with a monthly stipend of $300,000. The second option is a trip with Sir Richard Branson on Virgin Galactic. Europe. Okay. <laughs> Lovely. There we go. All right. All right. Our final question. Like 300,000 bucks in Europe lets you do some cool things. Um, mm. um, I, I, I've never been intrigued by Sir Richard Branson, though I totally understand that he's an impressive individual. And I, I think I'll get to space another way. Yeah. Fair. I hear you. Uh, all right. All right. Last question. Two unauthorized movies are made about your life. The first is an independently released documentary, primarily comprised of interviews with people who know you like us, um, bootleg, bootleg footage from things you've done like podcasts. Um, critics are describing the documentary as brutally honest and relentlessly fair. Meanwhile, Columbia TriStar has produced a big budget biopic of your life casting major Hollywood stars as you and all of your acquaintances. Though the movie is based on actual events, eh, screenwriters have taken some liberties with the facts. Critics are split on the artistic merits of this fictionalized account, but audiences love it. Which film would you be more interested in seeing and also who plays you in the blockbuster? Mm. Um, Brie, can I ask a follow-up question? You may. Which one uh, is more likely to be screenwritten by you? Oh, the blockbuster for sure. Mm, okay. I, I'm unfortunately um, sad to disappoint you, but we're going to go with the former um, the documentary. The documentary. Um, I, I probably wouldn't watch it, but if I were going to permit anything to occur, that would happen. And um, per another conversation we had offline, the most obvious character is not from a personality perspective, but from a lookalike perspective would either be Jason Siegel or Judge Reinhold, depending on what generation you're from. Wow. Uh, yeah. those, are your, those are your options. Um, um, you know, go to town, Steven Spielberg. And at least Jason Siegel will do front, front 
nudity. Frontal so, nudity. Yeah. And who <laughs> which 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 may which may actually mean that not only does he look alike, but you know, there's some personality traits <laughs> that are you know you know, as a man that spent a lot of time in a speedo. Um, here we are. <laughs> He also Here loves puppets. He loves puppets. He's a puppets puppet aren't so much my thing, but speedos are. <laughs> but you juggle. That's kind I do of juggle. Same, yeah, same I do juggle things. metaphorically and physically. Metaphorically. <laughs> All right, we've physically. got two All right. last presents for you. Open we them do. up. Uh, Let's do it. Which one? I, I got one with balloons on it, and I got one which looks like it belongs in the moment. So the Mickey Mouse bag, I think, is the one with the balloons on it. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. I'm opening the Mickey Mouse bag, but it feels Should like we... there's like a there's like a dead cat in here or something like that. What's there the is, yeah, a dead cat. There's a dead cat, totally. Well, That's... because it, it took I find two VCs weeks. love dead cats as a gift. It goes over well. It's um, pool boy. Oh, look at that. Yeah. It's the, the so pool sun's boy. Sun's out, guns out. Um, tech VC vest. Yes, yep. for, for those of you uh, not watching us on YouTube, Alex has revealed a soft gray Patagonia vest with the words pool boy uh, written on it. And um, obviously that will go with the rest of the gear that he's about to open up right there now. Might be Did one... I hear that you guys are having a vest party post COVID where uh, previous guests um, rock their vests? Yeah. yeah, it's called invest. Invest, will it be on a boat? possibly. Mm, mm. Yeah, it might be. Uh, was there one more thing in that bag, by the way? I think there might be one more thing. Yeah. By the way, now that you it's say small. that, it, will it's it be small. on the boat? It should absolutely be on a boat. Bri. I'm on a boat. Is I'm it in boat. there? Did you see it? Did you see the little There is. Extra... There is, is, this, is, this, is this a hot cookie brief? Is this smell <laughs> everywhere? <laughs> it is. We'd ask you to yes. wear it right now, but Hi. <laughs> this is a different Those level. Is this is that's for a different podcast. I, I wasn't planning to go on a fire island, but you know, it's not too <laughs> late. Like, is it is this is this is this what we're going with free? You know, I, I was delivering your gifts to Vic and I decided to go to hot cookie just for a little cookie. And then I, I decided cookie. to buy both you and Vic matching pairs of briefs. <laughs> what are you doing I for mean, Halloween, Vic? I don't, I'm, Do we I'm go to the gonna, Castro? We're going to the Castro, uh, which is a block away from me, and uh, we're going to wear our hot cookie uh, underwear. I think Halloween in the Castro will be a better time than Bernal Heights. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, way a way happier place, especially uh, especially if we wear these briefs. Yeah. Yes, you guys also, I don't know if I want to be around your kids. I don't want them to see me that in exposed. Briefs? They're very tight and very tiny. And I'm very, briefs very are very tiny. Yeah, the the briefs are very look look at the briefs. I know you're a, you're you're a I got him the bigger and... ones. I got you the the small pair. I think. Yeah, I got the really small ones. Free. I don't think they fit. Free. I don't think they fit. <laughs> we literally gave them to Laura. <laughs> yeah, we're just gonna Laura's gonna have to wear them. Um, yeah. Do I think we might have? We, we have, have a we the, have a balloon bag yeah, and we keep, have the modern keep opening bag. your presents. Just keep it's, opening just, it. Just keep, keep opening it. This up. is gonna be presents. Yeah, it's fun. Oh wow. So what do you got there? There it is. There uh, it this is. is. This is again for the hot girl summer. This is for and, your hot girl summer. It's a it's a pool. unicorn, it's a unicorn pool toy. We know you got kids. You got a new pool. That's you got that's, a pool pickle? What is a that's pool? That's a that's a pickle gun for your boys to shoot each other with. <laughs> Because you like pickles. Isn't that cute? I love it, but do I want my boys shoot? Yes, I do want my boys shooting. Yep. <laughs> well, 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 also for, for listeners in Miami, what they don't know is um, they're like, oh, it's, it's late August, like pool toys. Um, San Francisco summer is about to start next week. Yes. So this, yes. this is very, very exactly. timely. Um, very exactly. Timely. Thank you, guys. This is so awesome. Is this a giant ball? Of course, you have a giant beach ball. We wanted to get you a bunch of fun new pool toys for your new pool because yeah. um, we're excited for the invite to your pool. And, yeah, anytime. Uh, That's right. Anytime. Kind of, this is called hints. 
Um, yeah, I've, well, I've already started coordinating. Really, I, I didn't want to go it's there okay. in this episode, but if you do find yourself in, in Sonoma County, shoot me a text um, or, you know, email or tweet at me and we can hang out. We'll I don't do anything party. up there other than sit by the pool. I That's not yeah, for the barbecue. listeners. Listeners, you're not invited. It's, <laughs> it's just Vic and Brie. Mm, I mean, if they or bring marshmallows. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you heard it first. Tweet um, at we Alex. Have, we have one more bag. Yeah, tweet at me. Yeah, oh. see it, Alex. But we'll we probably don't here. don't don't come up there being like, "Hey, I want to pitch you in the hot tub." I heard that that ends really badly. So, <laughs> oh uh, wow, yeah, we don't want you to be canceled. Should we do uh, the last bag? Last yeah, bag. let's do let's the last do bag. It. Absolutely. We've we've had so much fun, listeners, that we are forty four minutes over the expected time <laughs> oh my gosh so to go cool. with what is the... cool candy Plink... oh is this a is this just a giant pink flamingo yes yes uh, it's like yes. a pink flamingo raft so now you so have... i should wear yeah. my hot cookie underwear and float in the pool <laughs> and tweet now yeah. that you say it out loud i don't know if it's a good idea but you know previously we were thinking shannon might get a good kick out of it yeah, that's good. actually this is perfect because our pool doesn't have a heater and it's very cold and she refuses to get in. So this means that she can be <laughs> in the pool without getting in the pool. That's right. It makes it, it it's really quite it's clean. over yeah. eight feet long. So I don't know how big your pool is, but that it's, is it's 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 not very big, and I don't have a hot tub per my previous comment. So you can't actually pitch me in the hot tub because the hot tub's broken and our pool is small. <laughs> but you, look, we can blow it up eight feet. It'll take up fifty percent of the pool. It'll be perfect. My kids hot tub, not a hot tub summer not a hot tub summer no no hot tub time machine okay uh, <laughs> well listen uh as i did mention we are way over and so we are so appreciative of the time that you've given us uh this afternoon slash evening alex uh you are obviously um one of my favorite people on the planet but I hope that everyone listening and watching out there gets a glimpse of the, um, you know, the thoughtfulness and the uh, time and effort that you spend in uh, sourcing all of your deals and working with all of your founders uh, and, and, and just being an all around good human and a great dad. So uh, to that, Bree and I want to thank you for being on the podcast and uh, cheers to you. Um, and as customary, um, it is now your time to give us a cheers. Uh, and it is your time to plug a company, uh, a political thought that you have, something that's top of mind, whatever it is, this is your 20 seconds. Uh, my 20 seconds would very simply be that um, friends are important in this world. And so thank you for your friendship, Vic. And um, I think that much like the entrepreneurial journey on the startup side gets talked about, I think the entrepreneurial journey on the venture side is one of admiration as well. And I know that what you're doing requires an immense amount of courage. And as a, as a friend and, 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 and longtime admirer, I'm cheering for you. And I hope that a lot of entrepreneurs see the set of skills that I see in you and work with you and to hear as we talked about at the beginning of this episode that you're already starting to see realizations hopefully for your investors is also truly exciting and then simultaneously Brie um, you know as folks that both enjoyed and loved the experiences that they had in Southern Orange County in their childhood and then simultaneously moved up north and um, I think that on a personality basis we've connected here pretty darn quickly in the first hour or two you have a career that touched on a lot of organizations that I like from your time to TriMet to Berkland. We haven't even talked about the fact that Jeff and I used to uh, run together on a regular basis. So I know your colleague quite well. Um, and, and my boss. <laughs> um, and, he's great, and, by the way. So I'm sure you um, guys had a great time. Um, yeah, he's a better runner than I am. <laughs> which is a pretty low bar. And, um, and I think what you all are doing here is, is just super neat and fun. Um, this is the aspect of the business that I like, the people. And so the cheers will be, be very simple, which is um, 
to this being something not just now, but a long time from now as well. Yep. Cheers. 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 Thank you. Enjoy this episode of Drinks with a VC. Please be sure to hit those like, share, and subscribe buttons on Apple, Spotify, Google, YouTube, or wherever you enjoy your favorite podcasts.